All right, welcome everyone to our uh, Coffee Dialogue episode number four. Um, today we are uh, talking about uh, regenerative agriculture in California. And I'm just pulling up um, some information about both of our uh, presenters. So first we're gonna hear from Dr. Cynthia Daly. Uh, Dr. Daly is a professor within the College of Agriculture at California State University, Chico, and currently serves as the Rawlings Endowed Professor of Environmental Literacy and the Director of the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems. Cindy is originally from Illinois, where her family has been actively engaged in the farming profession for more than four generations. She completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Illinois, her doctorate at the University of California, Davis. Uh, she joined CSU Chico COA faculty in 1997 and later founded the Organic Dairy Education and Research Program in 2006. Seeing the need to grow the ecological farming movement, Daly went on to co-create the Regenerative Agriculture Initiative in 2000, uh, 2016 and guided this program uh, to center status in May of 2019. The new Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems is a consortium of interdisciplinary faculty and farmers who recognize the ecological benefits of regenerative farming practices, including water conservation, soil fertility, carbon sequestration. The center's guiding principle is that agriculture when done regeneratively can be the solution to soil degradation and climate change. So Cynthia will be our uh, first presenter, and um, Jesse Smith will be our second pre uh, presenter, and I'll do a little brief introduction uh, before Jesse starts. And so, Cynthia, are you ready to begin? I think I am ready to go ahead and share screen. And let's try that. Great. So tell me, um, is are things working? Um, can you hear me okay? I don't want to jump off into a um, Things are a working great. Here from, Perfect. That's what I wanted to hear. And ben, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And I'm pretty excited to learn about the things that you folks have got cooking uh, down in that part of the world. Um, I should have known, you know, Jesse Smith would be involved in anything innovative down in through there. I really um, have come to really appreciate uh, the many talents of, of Jess, Jesse. So I'm looking forward to his presentation this afternoon as well. He's a, a colleague of ours. Um, we try to work together as often as we possibly can. Um, and he's in a part of the world where we are not. So it's really great that we have all these points of light um, around the globe, um, you know, thinking and uh, these new thoughts and looking at this, uh, you know, this issue, this, this new topic called regenerative um, agriculture. And I'm just curious, um, since we only have 10 of you, I went ahead and I hit my participants. I'd like to know how many of you have, have, engaged in this conversation at some level in regenerative agriculture. Just uh, hit your yes button or your hand up. I'm just curious as to how many of you are involved in regenerative agriculture or know anything at all about regenerative agriculture. Um, you know, based on my, good, good, Bonnie has. So maybe we have some of the diehards on this call and the rest of your team maybe should be here. So I'm hoping that we can get this word out to just about um, everybody. I think it's uh, it's an important message for for sure. And uh, as Ben indicated, we you know we've been involved in this dialogue now for um, quite a while. Um, we've been in the organic world since uh, 2005, and um, realized that we really needed to be speaking to a broader broader. Uh, group of producers and and we needed to also be focusing in on regenerative soil health 
production practices. So that's why we, we decided to jump into the um, center. Um, we started out as an initiative together with some of our farmer partners and, and our faculty, as, as Ben has already described. And we, we evolved that initiative into um, the Center for Regenerative Ag. We like this particular definition. It's, uh, it's one that's been massaged by many, many organizations. Uh, and there will be different definitions out there, just as there are different definitions for sustainability. So, uh, and we don't shy away from that. I, I think that that's okay. Um, but by and large, it describes farming and grazing practices that among other benefits reverse climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter and restoring degraded soil. And it restores biodiversity, reversing, um, resulting in carbon drawdown and an improvement in the overall water cycle. Two things that we really need today. Yeah, I've already talked to I think ultimately what, you know, um, there's, there's a, a big difference. It's like a 180 with respect to what is within production agriculture today. It's, it's soil disturbance and monoculture and really kind of this reductionist scientific approach uh, to producing food and fiber. Um, I, I accuse my family all the time of recreational tillage because they just love their tractors. And let's, let's face it. That's an impressive machine and it is easy to just, you know, fall in love with your equipment and, 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 you know, you've got a great excuse. You got to get out there and work that soil. You got to beat that soil into submission. And that's really what it's been like for the last, you know, 10, um, you know, for the last, I don't know, 40, 40 years. So four decades, at least uh, we've, we've gone down this, this path and regenerative is, is clearly the, the polar opposite of that. That's where we actually partner with nature. We try to mirror na na nature. We try to mimic nature, protect the soil, build diversity as much as possible, and then really look at it as a whole system. So it's a systems-based approach. So one is a net emitter, it's really part of the problem. And the regenerative approach would be more of the solution to um, a lot of the problems that we have today. I am gonna try and watch the chat as much as I can. So if there are some issues, I'll try and, and address those. Um, let me see. Uh, the five core principles that really make up regenerative agriculture, and these apply really no matter what production system we're talking about. You know, you may end up focusing in on some specific types of production practices, but the principles will apply. And that's to minimize soil disturbance. We don't, we don't need to be beating that soil into submission. We want to maximize crop diversity. And that whole idea is that it's part of that IPM. So you won't need as much weed control or pest control. Got to keep the soil covered. We got to protect that um, soil with, a, with a, a layer of armor, as some people would call it, or, or skin that's going to protect that soil moisture and protect the soil microbes that live there. Maintain a living root, because those roots are secreting exudates that feed that livestock in the soil. And then integrate livestock into your system when and where appropriate. And it must be managed. Uncontrolled animal um, impact is not what we're talking about. And ultimately, the outcomes that we all want to see are these. We want to improve soil health because that's the real legacy left on your farms, you know, for the next generation is, is just your soil integrity, your soil fertility. We want to foster as much biological diversity and these five principles will get Get you there and then to promote economic resiliency um, put that back into the farming community I barely recognize Sublet Illinois going back home these days and that's because all the money's been extracted out of agriculture and it's gone into other sectors of that food chain it's been sucked dry and you can tell it just in terms of how the the, the town has died and shriveled um, and we want to change that and that is part of the regenerative paradigm Keep in mind, you know, that there, we've got a lot of issues that we need to address and we need to change our thinking in order to address those issues. And I think a lot of producers would be shocked to learn that half of their fertilizer dollar is being lost into the ecosystem. You know, it's either being volatilized as, as greenhouse gas or it's being leached down into the groundwater. 
I mean, half of your fertilizer dollar. So that's pretty significant. And it is, it's creating a real problem with overall um, greenhouse gas emissions and the, the greenhouse effect that we're seeing and um, these huge shifts in, um, in weather patterns, are, you know, we're, we're, we're contributing to that problem, unfortunately so. And I can say that I'm from agriculture, they're my family, you know, um, but we have to recognize the fact that we've got problems that we need to address. And in addition to the greenhouse gas, we've got a lot of dead zones um, around the globe, not just in our Gulf, but 405 around the, the globe, 95,000 square miles of it. And it's not just going out into our oceans, it's leaching down into our groundwater. Um, so our aquifers are contaminated by and large in many, many places, clearly in the Central Valley. There are some places, some communities that can't even drink their own water. They have to be on bottled water because it would so severely impact their health. And there's another new study comes out that just really scares the heck out of me. And that's the fact that this nitrate, as it leaches into the groundwater, takes with it uranium. So, you know, the effect of uranium on bone and, and kidneys is, is very severe. So we've got issues that we need to take care of. Um, and, you know, all production is not, you know, created equal necessarily where nitrogen is concerned. That's why I was talking to Ben earlier about just how much nitrogen you guys use as, as coffee producers. I'd be interested to learn a little bit more about what that actually takes. So, you know, according to the, the data, the research shows that production systems vary in terms of their volatility and their leachability. Clearly the conventional high till annual cropping systems are the biggest offenders. So they're the ones that are gonna be leaching and creating some of this surface water contamination, groundwater contamination and greenhouse gas emissions. As you move into the perennial crops, which is really where coffee resides, you're a perennial cropping system. You, you guys look a little bit better there with respect to how much nitrogen is kind of lost from your system. So, you know, that's something that we ought to measure and look at and determine just what, you know, that, that truly amounts to. The other big issue that we have in around the globe is soil degradation. We're beating this soil to death. <laughs> and um, even in the US, there, there are estimates by the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is our USDA, at 1% of our topsoil every year. Um, and then they can equate that to a dollar loss. We're losing a lot of food and fiber production because we're washing our soil um, away. So that's why we think regenerative is the term that we need to put our money on. This is where we need to focus our energy and our time. Because, you know, the two decades of sustainable agriculture has not bore fruit. We, we're not any further down this paradigm than we, we were. So we need to think about regenerative. We don't want to sustain this degraded system. We really need to regenerate. And in order to do that, we're going to have to unlearn some of these production practices that you that we grew up with that I grew up with I mean my dad you know there wasn't a spray he didn't like and he liked to combine the two together and um, tillage was his friend you know those are the things that we grew up with they grew up with and we're going to have to unlearn that so that we can start to embrace a new paradigm and that paradigm looks more like what's on the right here. That's a very diverse, this actually is a cover crop in Princeton, California from my good friend, Danny Unruh, who grows walnuts um, together with his family. Um, he's, he's really a master at these things. This is about year eight for him with respect to his cover crops and his cropping system. He's a conventional walnut producer. He's not organic, but he's dropped his cost of production down to $800 per acre. So his yields are okay. Um, you know, you're not going to write home about it, but his net profit per acre is significantly higher than all of his high input neighbors. And ultimately, that's what it's about, right? It's, it's about net profit um, per acre and rebuilding this system. And so, you know, his kids are going to enjoy a very rich, deep soil that has um, a lot of water holding capacity, water use efficiency um, from him. So he's leaving his legacy right here. And, and unfortunately, today, if you asked most you know, walnut producers, what's beautiful, they'll, they'll look at this on the left and say, now that's a well-managed orchard. So my point is this, we need to change the way we think about 
what's a well-managed orchard. You know, this is bare, naked, dead, thirsty, and sterile. It's, the, the biology here is pretty minimal. It's what can survive the fertilizer, the spray, and you know the intensity of it all. The one on the right is a more biologically diverse. It's enlivened. It's more water use efficiency. It's, it's going to have a lot better numbers from a greenhouse gas perspective. And the same thing could be true of row cropping systems. You know, this on the right, you know, this is a no-till grain system that's, that's always going to be with the five principles in mind, assuming that they integrate livestock in on their at residue before they come in and, and, and reseed to the next crop and the crop rotation or the cover crop in that situation. So this is a beautiful no-till um, system. The one on the left, that's bare, naked, dead, thirsty, and sterile. We're killing you know, our microorganisms just as quickly as we're trying to proliferate them and you know uh, emitting greenhouse gas there's a lot of CO2 being released. You can almost see it a lot of soil being lost. <sighs> Intuitively um, you would just say that that's that's an outdated system that we need to move away from. So we are talking about polar opposites here. One is a high input, you know, reductionist approach. The other is more of a systems-based approach that is really building in tons of biological diversity. And suddenly that becomes a closed system. It doesn't require the inputs because you've enlivened the soil engine. And the soil engine, the microbiology, is really what's going to drive drive it home for you and kind of create that the the relative regen the relative benefits uh you know from well just about all aspects water air quality soil conservation everything has been very well established a lot less global warming associated with these regenerative type farming practices you just need less pest um, um, pesticide and herbicide less nutrient runoff we see more soil conservation, soil building, more soil organic matter, and um, it, it's just a, a better way all the way around. It's just hard to get there because it's something that we're not used to doing. Um, this is a little complex, but what my point of bringing this to you is that there's a lot of data out there that already shows about the greenhouse gas carbon sequestration potential of these different types of, of generative farming practices. Now clearly trees, perennial cropping systems are a great way to sequester a lot of carbon over time. Converting you know, some of these uh, cropping systems into a pasture-based silvopasture would be ideal. Adding biochar is a wonderful idea if what you're trying to do is maximize carbon sequestration and improve water use efficiency. How many of you are familiar with uh, Gabe Brown? It's a name everybody recognizes now. I think with the, the new movie that's out, everybody, everybody's heard about Gabe. I understand from Walter <laughs> that he was actually talking to Prince Charles last week. So Gabe, you know, G Gabe is our poster child. And what I love about this graph, this is a graph that my colleague, uh, Dr. David Johnson put together for Gabe's farm. It basically shows the change in his soil carbon over time over his learning curve, over his learning curve in regenerative ag. So he started out in 1993 when, you know, he had three or four years of crop loss and he went into a no-till system kind of because he had to um, and got into crop diversity and cover crops. And then pretty soon he built up enough soil organic matter that he reached kind of this, this magic point. Um, this is kind of the turning point for him where he could stop using nitrogen fertilizers because what he had done was build enough biology in his soil that it was happening for him and he didn't need to add the additional um, inputs. So we owe a debt of gratitude to, to uh, Gabe and the work that he's done and, and I really do appreciate the number of scientists that have been on his uh, program really studying his systems-based approach. Uh, to production agriculture. And what Gabe does so well is that he stacks practices. So he's stacking his conservation tillage with cover and crop rotation, compost, animals, livestock. He's maximizing diversity. And there's a synergism there that these things add up to more than their independent numbers. So there's synergism that takes place. And we're trying to build this very biologically diverse ecosystem. And when we do that, we kind of create this 
thing we call quorum sensing. And that's, that's, we're not talking about any one bug. So this is not a bug in the jug talk. This is about building a very diverse biological community. And this very diverse um, self-assembling um, community starts to interact and um, communicate um, in a way that is um, quite collaborative. So they use this cell-to-cell -cell communication system called quorum sensing to coordinate population density dependent changes in their behavior. And they start gene regulating together and send out signal structures and they start interacting basically um, with the plant root tips themselves in a true symbiotic type relationship. And what we're seeing is that there are, in fact, under these kinds of systems, in a quorum sensing system, we've got a lot of free living nitrogen fixing bacteria that we didn't know anything about. So this is kind of a new thing for those of us that kind of study these systems. We knew about the symbiotic ones. We knew about the rhizobia and you know the the, the nodules on these leguminous plants that fix nitrogen and you know, you know, but we didn't really understand the whole idea of free living organisms um, that were um, also out there. If we build it, they will produce that nitrogen for us. And we have 70% nitrogen above, you know, in the atmosphere. So it's just waiting to be fixed and pulled down into the soil so it can be utilized um, by our cropping systems. We just have to be smart enough to figure out how to make that happen. Uh, we also learned a lot about these fungal species. And I know that there's um, a Dr. White that, um, uh, that um, eco agriculture they've got a course now that that talks about this integration of these fungal species together with the root tips they actually they actually start to um, integrate into the root structure itself and start turning genes on and, and causing this plant to do its thing. It's really quite stunning how, how collaborative um, this is. And again, you know, this is where the beauty of the carbon sequestration happens uh, because this, these mycorrhizal um, hyphae are secreting um, glomulin or uh, glomalin. It kind of depends on where, what part of the country you're from. Glomalin is a it's it's a really hardy uh, proteinaceous substance that is carbon based that creates some very, very stable carbon. So that's the kind of carbon sequestration we we want to create um, in our systems, and it does create this glue that holds our soil together. So when you look at a slake test in a no-till system that's very rich in in biology, particular fungal species biology, you'll see that those soils hang together quite well. Um, you know, even under the conditions of a slake test where we put that dried aggregate into water and it doesn't disassociate. Whereas the, there was <laughs> an aggregate that was put into this column that is from the conventional till. There's no glue holding that soil together. So naturally it gets lost, it gets lost. And it is pretty easy to kind of see a, a true regenerative system. Um, it has to be a matured regenerative system. You just have to use your shovel, go out and take a shovel, turn over some soil, and um, you can see it. And this is sort of what it looks like, rich, rich in biology. And it looks like this um, cottage cheese, uh, very, you know, beautiful, porous um, aggregates. Um, yeah, so you'll know it when you see it. It's a beautiful thing. We've been working with uh, Dr. Johnson and his wife, Wei Chin, now for quite a while, um, looking at um, a system that they developed called the Biologically Enhanced Ag Management System. And it is a system, but at the root, at the foundation of the system, is this biologically diverse compost that they produce. Um, and this material is made in these bioreactors. And if you, know, you can go online, he's got a, a lot of YouTube um, uh, videos out We've got a website, a landing page that's devoted to his research and videos on how to use the material and so on. But what he does here is he creates a very biologically diverse inoculum that you can use to revitalize dead soils. So if your soil is completely beat up, this is a great remedy uh, for that system. He's done the metagenomic work on this and this compost runs, there's about uh, 2,600 different um, organisms um, in, this, in this medium. And so that's why we tend to call it an inoculum rather than compost. And some of our preliminary data, this is a, 
We've, uh, we're in the middle of uh, several uh, multi-year research projects. This happens to be the conventional corn bean rotation that we have in Wilcox, Arizona at a Howard Buffett farm there, um, looking at the effect of beam in contrast with their usual conventional type practice. And if um, I got to move my, my screen around here a little bit so I can get at this. Okay, so um, we're in corn, we're in alfalfa, we're in cotton, we're in rangeland, um, and we're in veg. So we're um, trialing this in a whole host of other places besides uh, David's um, research that he's conducted in New Mexico State University. So with this, we've got a conventional system which is using 256 units of nitrogen, very typical um, of a conventional corn system. The other treatment, and this is all in replicated studies. So we did replicate, randomize, you know, this is legit. So we did a 15% fertilizer here because we're a little worried, you know, what might happen. Um, if we didn't give this corn, which is a very um, nitrogen loving crop, any, any nitrogen at all, other than what the biology could establish. And so essentially that was 38 units of nitrogen in that system. And then we had the full beam with no additional nitrogen. And if we looked at and calculated the amount of nitrogen that was actually lost, to leaching or to volatilization, we lost 126 units of nitrogen there. That's a substantial economic loss. Um, in the other two systems, we had a net gain in, in um, overall nitrogen use efficiency. And if I go in the overall yield, um, we did see a yield decline in the beam only. Um, but if, if you look at the overall net profit or increased revenue per acre, there was an $86 advantage to the conventional system in the beam only. Um, the beam plus the 15%, um, so you know, it was 121. So you know, the beam treatments were the more economically viable treatments and you know, didn't result in any nitrogen leaching or nitrogen loss um, um, in that system. So that, that in itself is what, you know, Doug is particularly excited about and I, I think will be very interesting as we go forward because this is just the year one and this is going to be a five-year study so stay tuned it's going to get better yet. <laughs> Conclusions the biologically enhanced you know it basically negates some of that fertilizer use it did improve the overall biologi biological diversity and water holding capacity and the return per acre. So those were really our conclusions. And I get asked all the time, um, why aren't you organic? And, and, and frankly, we've got 99% of all the agricultural landscapes out there are not organic and they don't have any real incentive to want to go there. And we need some way to move them from where they are in the conventional system into a more organic like production system and clearly regenerative is that gateway. So we can talk that talk with a lot of conventional producers and we can't talk the organic talk with them. I mean, I, I, mean, I understand that culture because they are my culture. Um, and so we need to speak in a language that they understand. And the regenerative one makes sense um, economically, environmentally, socially. So that's the one that we're going to focus in on, trying to transition as much land as we possibly can into this. And frankly, as you kind of go down this path, some of them will then, the light will come on and say, well, as long as I'm already here, I can become certified organic. So, you know, this is kind of the future of, of farming in my mind. And that's these, these farmers who are embracing this technology going down this biological path. And it, it doesn't matter what your production system, doesn't matter what your soil type, you know, you can make these, these practices work um, in your system. It just takes a commitment on your part. And then we need a monitoring system to monitor the progress. And, you know, we've got a lot of issues that we need to work on in production agriculture. We need to accept that fact, and then we need to change our thinking in order to get there. And that's really what we're about. The Center for Regenerative Agriculture is, is really focused in on that. Um, we, we've got, we spent the first couple of years just bringing in research funding in order to get the research done on some practical systems-based research projects. Um, we have a master's program currently that's a residential program. You do have to be on site to 
to do that. Um, we're at eight graduate students and we're trying to figure out how to manage all of that. Um, we're working on an online master's so that we can be global. I think that that would be, um, the, we have a lot of demand for that. We get a lot of inquiries about an online master's. So I think there's a lot of farmers out there that would love to be able to take it to the next level through a master's. And half of those eight are farmers uh, of the, the current ones that we have that are local. Cool. Um, we're also working on a professional course series. Um, the first course we're, we just beta tested this fall um, with 20 of our students. I've got a, a second course that we're beta testing in the spring and currently I am overloaded in that course. Um, I'm over enrolled. So that's very exciting to see. And um, we have our third course that we're going to be offering the following fall as part of our, our overall program. And from an outreach and education, we have a ton of partners and a white, the White Buffalo Land Trust is, is one of those partners. And I'm pretty excited to turn this over to Jesse at this point, because I would imagine I'm over my 30 minutes. So I'm gonna turn this back to my host and, and hope that I haven't gone over too badly. But thank you very much for giving me the time today. I, I just love this topic, obviously. I've got a lot of passion for it. So, um, and I'll stick around for questions. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Um, yeah, it's, it's fine. It's not a hard stop at 30 minutes, so you, it's, it's fine. We appreciate the information. Um, definitely interested in that online master's program. That sounds wonderful. And for anyone who has any questions that comes up during uh, the presenter's presentation, Please feel free to write them in the chat box if you want to remember them. And then at the end, we can kind of go through um, the questions. So I, I put one question myself there for Cynthia about learning a little bit more who is Dr. White and the ecological agricultural class. And we can review that after uh, Jesse's presentation. Um, so, um, Brief introduction around uh, Jesse. So first and foremost, Jesse is a Lakers fan, which is, the, no, um, Jesse's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's been thrilled to meet him since I've uh, been living up in Santa Barbara. Um, he's a new uh, fringe coffee grower. He just got some coffee plants from fringe this year. So he's planted some at White Buffalo. Uh, White Buffalo, um, is uh, the place where Jesse is the director of land stewardship, um, where he is leading a team uh, focusing on practicing, promoting, and perfecting the principles and practices of regenerative agriculture. He's the owner and co-founder of Regenerative Capital. He is uh, the farm land program lead at Kiss the Ground. And he does a number of consulting uh, projects with uh, companies like Terra Genesis. And he comes from a background in visual communication design, industrial design, and technology, and permaculture design. So Jesse brings a, a wealth of, of information and knowledge, and we are really excited to have him on board as a, as a new fringe coffee grower, because he'll be trying out some uh, new kind of experimental techniques at White Buffalo for, for growing coffee that hopefully we can we can eventually kind of transfer that uh, the results over to other growers. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jesse and put myself on mute. Thank you so much, Ben, and uh, thank you so much, Cindy, for um, taking about 80% of my presentation and doing it for me. Um, you know, this is one of the beauties of uh, working in this field is that there's starting to be, become a, a nodal network of uh, organizations and individuals who are uh, promoting this work around the world. Um, and so we are very grateful to have partners in NorCal up at Chico State, especially one uh, with the recognition uh, of an institution of higher education and really promoting uh, this work through their uh, research, through um, their um, uh, their different experimental projects, um, as well as for the, the journal that's starting to uh, get some of the published research out there that really is going to be the underpinning of policy changes, uh, as well as uh, incentives for farmers around the nation. Um, so thank you, Ben, for inviting me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, as Ben 
mentioned, uh, we're a nonprofit organization, White Buffalo Land Trust, uh, located in Central Southern California. Uh, our headquarters are uh, in Santa Barbara County, and our flagship farm is in Summerland. Um, you know, we are a new uh, coffee growing um, partner for Fringe. Uh, so I'm going to give uh, a little bit of an overview of our organization, our approach to regenerative agriculture, what we're doing here in this region, uh, as well as uh, what has led uh, to the partnership with Fringe and why we feel coffee um, production is nested within our, our approach to uh, regenerative agriculture uh, on, the, on this local landscape. So our organization uh, has four key fields of focus. We have, um, uh, sorry, I was looking at the chat to make sure it wasn't for me. Okay, uh, everyone can hear me all right? Is that fair enough? Okay, great. Um, our four key fields of focus are land stewardship, uh, education and training, scientific research and product development. Uh, we believe that the work that we do as a nonprofit uh, is rooted in the actual on the ground and in the soil work, though that's the uh, underpinning and, and foundation of all the other programmatic related efforts that we engage in. Um, we have a flagship farm that's 12 acres in Summerlin, California. It's a certified organic avocado orchard uh, planted uh, in the mid 70s and having different iterations of avocado and citrus. Um, and so we call this kind of a legacy orchard because it's very uh, indicative of a lot of the, the orchard landscapes in Santa Barbara County, uh, as well as into Southern California. And we feel like the demonstration that we are um, engaging with on that property can help inform some of the transition uh, that other producers are looking to, to, to go through um, over the coming years and decades. Uh, we also see that education and training uh, is equally as important, both uh, education as in uh, community engagement uh, through ecological literacy, uh, as well as farmer training uh, in order to provide the actual on the ground skills uh, to be able to implement some of these regenerative principles uh, in the context of each unique place. Um, if scientific research is the language of our culture, we obviously feel that um, uh, degrees hold a great amount of, uh, of weight in how we um, value information. And so we feel that the, the research process, the scientific process, uh, needs to underpin so much of our learning, um, even though we also simultaneously understand that uh, de while dealing with complex living systems, there uh, sometimes is not a, a quantitative uh, um, approach that can be had to the understanding of evolving uh, living in diverse ecosystems. So both holding those as, as equally true and, and relevant. Um, and then we also believe that product development um, is a key component of how we actually uh, engage with the customer base, and uh, I'll explore that in a little bit as well. Um, so through our land stewardship, uh, we take a place-based approach to improving ecological function through agricultural production. And I think that this is a, a shift in the mental paradigm of uh, us as humans. Uh, I think that there's uh, an innate um, draw to feeling that humans, by our um, essence, actually create uh, disturbance and destruction and and start to degrade living systems and I, I am for one don't believe that I feel like we actually have the ability to evolve into a keystone species that can produce our food and fiber and medicine and fuel in a way that actually improves ecological function um, through appropriate technology through uh, well-designed and planned landscapes um, and through regenerative agriculture which really has um, uh, a doorway for uh, almost anyone to enter um, whether it be through human health or food or policy um, uh, or education, there's so many different avenues for people to really engage in this topic. Uh, so our land stewardship really hinges on uh, caring for soil health, uh, nutrient cycling, water resources and biodiversity. Um, but we also have kind of a high level uh, look at um, a lens that we call keystone crops. And these keystone crops um, that we have listed here are ones that we've actually uh, decided to engage with uh, in the first few years of our foundation's uh, operation uh, because of the importance that they have within the culture of our community. Obviously here in uh, California, um, all of these cropping systems have very, very uh, strong implications on the ecological function of our landscape, on the financial ramifications of our farmers and, uh, and ranchers, um, as well as uh, a really important 
uh, piece to say about the story of culture um, uh, and the history of, of farming in this region. Uh, and so we have used these as lenses by which we approach uh, seeing a shift towards a new and, and regenerative approach to agriculture on these landscapes. Uh, we also engage with uh, community education in a way that we actually want those who don't decide to make farming and ranching part of their livelihood um, and uh, uh, give them the platform to be able to engage in living ecosystems. So we have volunteer days and field days on our property. Uh, we bring um, thought leaders in the space of regenerative agriculture together in a speaker series, um, although now it's uh, online and virtual. Uh, we used to host it in the context of our offices where we actually would invite people around food and, and, and beverage so they can actually immerse themselves um, in, in what's happening regionally, as well as obviously engaging with the youth in, uh, and young minds through school tours and elective series that once again underpins a lot of the regenerative principles um, in introducing them to, uh, to kids in a way that they can take those home and help inform the purchasing decisions of their parents, uh, as well as how they care for their own landscapes within their family. Um, as I mentioned, uh, producer training is one that is key to the future of our development being a regenerative form of agriculture as becoming a status quo. Um, we're gonna have a great uh, many parcels of land transitioning hands within this country over the coming decades. Uh, and there's a deep need for uh, capable and willing hands to be able to take up the mantle of stewarding uh, these pieces of land. And so um, we've identified some uh, key uh, uh, platforms in which we really wanted to uh, provide the resources here regionally for those who wanted to uh, develop a deeper understanding of holistic management, specifically around rangeland management and livestock management. Um, as well as for farm planning and design, understanding for those who are looking to purchase land um, or are looking to start new agricultural projects, um, understanding what the design process looks like uh, from the lens of uh, ecological stewardship and community engagement, and, and obviously uh, the actual agricultural production and financial modeling. Um, and then for those who are maybe already in deep multi-generational farmers, um, kind of reinforcing the importance of the principles of soil health is sometimes um, a remembering as to what previous generations uh, might have already known or had already practiced, um, but bringing it within the modern context of uh, appropriate technology, new tools, new equipment, uh, and new research. Um, and on that front, you know, the scientific research that we have uh, really focused on is meant to address a lot of the barriers that we see to the rapid and wide-scale adoption of regenerative agriculture. Uh, we feel that there's there needs to be living landscapes that actually are in the midst of uh, developing uh, financially viable agricultural enterprises that also are engaging with um, institutions and researchers and conservation groups in a way that develops experimental research projects. Um, we also feel that it's important for us to continue to monitor the ecological function in this baseline state uh, and over time the different uh, changes in those states in order for us to start to align um, and associate practices with the outcomes, whether positive or negative, so we can adapt our management um, and really learn from, um, uh, from, from the research. Um, the other big one that we're constantly innovating around is a better uh, understanding of ecosystem service marketplaces. Um, and we kind of subdivided that into three different categories, uh, one of which is focused on um, the kind of credit payment structure where you actually are developing uh, something like a carbon credit that can be uh, mobile and transferable. Uh, these have high costs of, um, of, of verification but also can provide uh, large landowners uh, and land managers the ability to monetize uh, some of these regenerative practices. Um, whereas there's also the uh, more novel kind of regional or boutique ecosystem service marketplaces that um, extend beyond just carbon credits into um, water uh, infiltration or biodiversity and habitat creation um, and uh, and the other kind of ecological benefits of these principles and practices. Uh, and those are a little bit more nuanced and relationship-based, uh, 
um, that can be paid by private uh, buyers or uh, organizations or even from uh, mitigation funds. And those uh, prices can be negotiated um, that might be able to offer incentives to smaller landholders that um, they wouldn't necessarily get from uh, a larger um, uh, ecosystem service marketplace like one like Gold Standard or Vera that do the large verification uh, for carbon credits. Um, and then the third one is um, focused more on um, kind of market differentiation. So uh, data collection to inform management um, and that data collection to underpin a, a marketplace a claim. So actually being able to show um, on package or to a buyer uh, that the, the, produce, uh, the production that you're offering actually has a positive ecological benefit. Um, and, and that may not be a one-to-one, -one, you know, I sunk this much carbon, so I get paid this much money, but it might be, you know, this, this production, increased habitat, native wildlife, riparian corridors, um, and that story can be told on package from brands, and so they can actually pay a price premium for it. And so that's really where we're engaging around um, the scientific research and ecosystem services marketplaces. And as I mentioned, the product development piece became uh, very clear for us early on, uh, kind of um, uh, early stages of our organization, as we knew that as a nonprofit, um, we wanted to, one, be able to value add philanthropic dollars to support our education and our research. Um, but we also wanted to show the agricultural viability of regenerative agriculture. Um, and so we felt that we needed to run enterprises on our property as well as develop products in the marketplace that represented what we knew needed to happen on the land. And so uh, we developed a, a brand uh, called Figure Eight Foods. Uh, our first product was uh, a naturally fermented persimmon vinegar um, as a way to highlight a climate beneficial crop that's highly resilient, drought tolerant, um, and, and highly nutritious. And we have a, a short list of products that we'll be uh, releasing over the coming months and years um, that will uh, focus more on climate appropriate crops, uh, climate beneficial proteins, uh, grazing systems, as well as a transition to, to perennial staple crops from some of our annual uh, grain production. So um, now that we're, you know, Taking a deeper dive into the actual production side, you know, one of the reasons why Ben invited me here to talk was um, our focus on avocados. Um, and the kind of subset of that is um, the kind of uh, integrated nature of coffee within those systems. Uh, so as we start to identify avocados as a keystone crop, we then start to ask, well, what is the future of that evolving system look like in this region over time. Um, and so when we look at developing these systems or managing these systems, we use a framework that was uh, coined by uh, Darren Doherty um, and his Rebrarians platform um, and rooted in uh, a key line scale of permanence uh, that was originally conceived of by PA Yeomans out of Australia working in their arid dry lands for rehydrating their soils through key line design. Um, but one of the most valuable pieces that we've gathered from this is a framework for a design process that essentially looks at the relative permanence of different elements on a landscape and how they influence the design considerations of uh, your, your, your agricultural system. And so these different layers are not necessarily sequential, but each one is uh, reliant and builds on the past um, or the, 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 the predecessor. Uh, so when we come to a property, which you see in the background is our 12 acre um, avocado orchard. Um, in the foreground, you can see um, the block that is now uh, currently being planted with, um, with coffee. Um, these trees were um, grossly mismanaged uh, prior to us taking over management in May of 2018. The canopies had been overgrown and uh, the nutrition plan had all been but abandoned. They had had uh, municipal water essentially put on them to keep them alive. So our first uh, bit of uh, business was to actually stump these uh, and, and start to care for their canopy uh, regrowth so that we can start to create a new scaffolding uh, for that orchard. Um, but with, when we did uh, do our plan to, to, to stump these trees, we quickly realized the um, opportunity we had with the increased light infiltration 
into the understory to develop a, a, a more uh, multi-story agroforestry approach. So we went through this process looking at both the biophysical restraints as well as the human uh, restraints and opportunities uh, that we had within the context we were working. So as I as it's noted there in the first one, you know, obviously we're going to have these um, uh, these elements like how much precipitation we get, where our prevailing winds are coming from, what's the um, what's the relative humidity, you know, uh, when our first frost date is going to be if we get frost, you know, all these things we have to consider. But then there's also the the human climate because if we had only looked at the biophysical, um, then we might not have actually come to a that coffee would be uh, the right crop to plant. But understanding that um, we live in a culture that um, consumes a lot of coffee, we live in a region that has uh, a lot of mobile income to be able to support specialty crops, and we live in uh, the context of a coffee growing culture, I'm mean, sorry, a, um, uh, uh, an avocado growing culture that's looking for opportunities to create more value from the land that's already in coffee or to be able to transition to a, a, a process or a management style that is more diverse than just monocropped avocados. Um, all of those factors led us to the conclusion that coffee is um, a really interesting and a really opportune uh, crop to, to be able to trial within this system. So then we went down this list of understanding our gradient, our slope, what kind of soil we had, what kind of water access and quality we had, um, and then how we were gonna actually access not only uh, the, the, the different elements for planting, for harvesting, for pruning, but how we were gonna also access markets, how we we're gonna access our customers, all those kind of things. And then we got to dive in after all of those elements to the actual design of the agroforestry system itself. Um, all the different uh, layers that you see below that um, uh, all play an other key roles, but I won't dive into them as much, although I will talk a little bit about soils here in a minute. Um, so now, you know, what I was mentioning was, you know, we made this identification is that, you know, where grows the avocados so too uh, you can grow coffee. And that was the, you know, uh, general overlay of, uh, of our understanding is that, you know, they, they, they can work in a similar climate um, hence, we can build a diverse system around both of these crops, both of them with high economic value. So as we dove into the site design and we started looking at a multi-story agroforestry approach, um, we essentially are looking at um, the uh, recreation of a functional forest ecosystem. We wanted to use the different functional groups of a forest but do it in a way that was well designed for ease of access, harvest, pruning, um, and, and light. So, you know, as, as Cynthia was mentioning, um, you know, our question in, immediately became, uh, what are the nutrition uh, and, and water needs of, of coffee? Um, and how does that actually match up with, with avocados? Um, you know, they, they have different, uh, slightly different watering regimes, they have slightly different nutrient needs, um, and ultimately we're going to have to address those separately at first, but ultimately we want to evolve into a system that is slightly more self-regulating. It's one that actually has in situ um, nutrient cycling with nitrogen fixing trees and living ground cover um, and the actual topographic uh, design so that we can value add the precipitation that we do get in our dry and southern, drier Southern California uh, region. So we looked at first some of the major uh, constraints that we could have on, uh, on coffee, which are very similar to some of the constraints you can have on avocado, which you know, for us are these hot, dry winds that come through in summer called the Santa Ana winds. Um, they can you know, greatly dehydrate your, your crops, your soil, your leaves, burn your leaves. Um, and so we wanted to start to mitigate some of that effect, not only uh, um, by nesting the coffee amongst the, the avocados, but also by nesting the avocados and the coffee underneath an overstory tree, uh, which we chose as Inga edulis, uh, or ice cream bean. Uh, not necessarily having the highest economic value, but it's a very, quote unquote, cheap uh, plant to install. It's a fairly fast growing plant. Um, it has a great canopy structure that if well um, designed in place can also 
um, provide um, the right amount of dappled shade um, and, and, uh, and essentially an overstory windbreak, um, while also not occluding uh, too much light to be able to reach the understory. So we essentially have it planted in every other row of avocado, uh, avocado line and every other um, kind of interstitial basin um, of the avocado trees. So it's a pretty wide space grid throughout the orchard. Um, the, the main story is our avocado trees, um, and then we've nested the, uh, the coffee as a, a, another mid story that essentially, I'm sorry, as, as the mid story um, on the bottom side of our avocado basins. One thing to note here as well is that when we did our stumping, um, instead of removing the biomass and, and chipping it, we actually left the logs whole. You can kind of see one on the bottom right hand corner here sticking up. Um, and we created a, a little crescent moon uh, basin underneath each one of the trees in order to start to create a self terracing effect where the leaf matter from both the overstory as well as the avocados themselves will start to ac accumulate around the root structure of those avocados. Um, and we've started to use a straw mulch because of its um, uh, great capacity to, um, uh, to feed mycelial um, hyphae. Um, as well as uh, its kind of thermal protection layer uh, when we get um, those hot days. And so um, we've mulched both the avocados and you can see this coffee line right behind the text with this straw as a way to diffuse rain and precipitation as well as keep uh, moisture in the soil later into the spring. Um, then kind of diving into the in-situ um, uh, fertility management, we identified uh, pigeon pea as a great opportunity for us to um, be able to bring a nitrogen fixing shrub for a chop and drop that would start to support that ice cream bean for longer term fertility management. Um, and then as you see as well, um, the understory of turmeric, ginger, canna, and sweet potato, both as chop and drop as well as living ground cover, um, as well as pollinator habitat, bird and butterfly and bee habitat, um, and then using um, the output of our composting bioreactors as a soil inoculant uh, to be able to infuse into our mulch application. Um, we've also put two dragon fruit on each one of uh, the copy, I'm sorry, the uh, avocado trees to use the scaffolding infrastructure of each of the, uh, the, the stumped um, uh, um, tree trunks in order to be able to uh, use those as the, the climbing apparatus. Um, and I believe Ben will be sharing um, the link after this, but there's a great um, research paper here on using uh, pigeon pea in coffee production systems and the nitrogen uptake in that coffee um, through um, a chop and drop and mulching system. And so the link is right there. Um, we also uh, decided to do a trial on uh, a novel innovation technology called BRI, which uses uh, these essential soaker, essentially a soaker hose um, at the end of a quarter inch spaghetti line to be able to directly apply a plume of moisture under the surface of the soil. So once again, we're not losing uh, any moisture due to direct evapor evaporation of, or from overhead sprinklers. Um, and we're not losing, uh, or we're not applying through drip at the surface um, in the hope that it can actually reduce the amount of um, weed, ger weed seed germinations at the surface as well. Um, these have been trialed uh, very successfully in, um, in grape production, in avocado production, almond production, and are now actually being installed on a very large project on, uh, in Kauai uh, for coffee production. They were very disappointed. They weren't, more, uh, they weren't a couple years into the trial yet. They didn't have any data to share with me. Um, but on their other crops, they've been uh, finding anywhere from 30 to 60% water savings. Uh, in, uh, in the use of, uh, of this irrigation technology. Um, and so we're, we're putting um, these in as our um, irrigation and they allow for direct um, uh, liquid uh, fertilizer and um, inoculant application as well, which was a, a key piece for us. Um, as, we, uh, as I mentioned, you know, soil health is always a paramount for us for the long-term viability of our operation. Um, we approach that through our thermophilic composting system. Um, that's quick, it's hot, um, it produces a bacterially dominated uh, compost that we can use in some of our um, faster turnover, short-lived annuals, and in some of our potting mixes. Um, but what we're really excited about and what uh, Cynthia Dahlia uh, brought to your attention 
which was the static aerated bioreactors developed by David, uh, Dr. David Johnson and Hoisin Chu. Uh, we also have been uh, working with biochar production uh, to be able to use that inoculant um, to, to inoculate our biochar. And then we're doing a, a split test where every we have five lines of, uh, of coffee being, going, uh, being planted, each line has uh, 10 trees uh, split into two five foot or five tree blocks. Um, so 50 trees total, um, where we're actually using a biochar application in the planting mix as well to see if we're, we can get any um, data on whether that helps with either moisture retention or any kind of um, uh, increased growth or production. Um, and then a big focus on uh, green manures through uh, nitrogen fixing trees, shrubs, ground covers, uh, and then tubers uh, being used for chop and drop. Um, I just wanted to quickly show a little bit of our process for using the bioreactors. Um, we, we use these 55 gallon drums as an intermediary material collection system. Um, we use on-site manure that comes from uh, our, our little small herd of, uh, of, of cattle and a horse and uh, what used to be a white buffalo she passed earlier this year um, on our property. Um, we fill up six of these bins and that will fill up ultimately one of those bioreactors which you see here in the back. There's six of them right there in that second uh, part of the bioreactor build. Um, we build around those cores that ultimately are held open by a fungal network or fungal hyphae. Um, uh, and then we toss worms in once that thermophilic process has, uh, has cooled down and the worms essentially do the rest of the job, uh, compressed to about a third of the ori original uh, volume. And uh, our finished inoculum uh, comes out looking very much like a clay slip, very little remnants left over uh, of any kind of manure or sticks or straw or anything like that. I mean, then we can use that either as a cover crop uh, um, seed inoculant, we use it as a root trench, we use it as a foliar spray, um, we, we use it in our nursery. Uh, I mean, there, there's really nothing that we don't use it for. Um, and then moving into enterprise, you know, this is something that um, has been a big part of our organization from the beginning, and, and it's one of the main reasons why we we're excited to, to work for work with, the, with Fringe Coffee on this project. You know, we felt like they took a really unique and, and forward-thinking approach to how to develop uh, a producer's cooperative and, and growing cooperative um, by creating a brand that meant something for our industry. Um, and so our organization um, has developed its own CPG brand. Um, we're working with producer cooperatives such as this, um, as well as um, uh, engaging in strategic brand partnerships, um, working with uh, an organization called Koyuchi who does organic textiles, um, and, and organic cotton as we work uh, in a cotton project in the Central Valley as well. All of which, once again, to reinforce the need in the marketplace for more options um, to support this rejected movement. So I think I might have squeezed in there under 30 minutes um, and that will be a wrap. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Jesse. That was a great presentation. And uh, let's just go into some of the questions. So if you have more questions, feel free to uh, put them in the box. I'll just start kind of at the top and uh, working through the questions and uh, either Jesse or Cynthia, if you want to jump on one, if it sounds great, then we can just move through them. So the first one comes from me. I was just asking a little bit, who is uh, Dr. White and where is the ecological agricultural class taking place? Looks like you put some uh, links in the, in the chat room. I did, yeah. You can find his course is made available on the John Kemp website. Um, and he's got what he calls Regen Ag Academy. Um, he has several courses that he's offering. I've never taken any one of those, although I've heard really good things about understanding rhizophagy, which is the course that's taught by James White. He's a professor of plant biology at Rutgers University. Um, and I've heard his, you can go on and do a YouTube with, with James as well. I'm just gonna share my screen real quick so that you can see what I'm, I'm talking about. So this is uh, John's website. He, he's focused, back in the East Coast, but he's got a big following, big podcast. He's an innovator. He's a farmer. He's brilliant. 
Um, these, this is the new platform for teaching, and so he's put together some user-friendly courses. So um, pretty heavy in the biochem area, I mean, because that's kind of how John's mind thinks, and he's into plant nutrition in, in a big way. And I think you'll find several of these courses now kind of dive into the biological realm, which is really you know, where, where I, I want to spend my time, is in that biological realm in, in soil and, and plant health. So that's it, and the instructors you know, are either John, James White, Oliver Husson, and Jerry Hatfield. You probably recognize um, Dr. Hatfield's name. He's the agronomist with uh, USDA ARS. Um, we are going to put our professional course series on John's platform. Um, we just, um, I mean, we're in that development stage. You just don't make those overnight. So those are gonna take a little time. I'm in Blackboard Learn, he's in a different learning platform. So we're gonna make that transition. So you'll see some of our courses show up here as well. It's a nice platform. And John is also coming forward with a, 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 a like a producer network that's called Kind Harvest. Um, it's a subscription kind of a thing, but it's a great way where you can interact with producers from all over the globe. Um, and we really are a big proponent of that and really want to push out uh, to farmers into the farming community as many opportunities to network as possible. As you know, that's a great, great way to learn, to learn from each other. <laughs> you know, for many cases, you, you, you know, and your mistakes are just as valuable as your successes. And to, to share that on an open platform in a way, you know, that, that's really easy to share. So um, anyway, I'll stop share. And yeah, that, that was my answer to that question, Ben. I'm sorry, I digress. No worries. I was, I was, <laughs> gonna, I was gonna say, Cindy, I was gonna say, Cindy, if you wanted, I saw another one in there um, that I mentioned it, but you might want to expand upon is the regenerative ag journal that you guys uh, are working on up at, at Chief Health. Let me explain a little bit more about what, what that purpose was. Sure, sure. We're, um, we've, it, the Regenerative Ag Journal is about systems-based research and systems-based success. So um, we've put together an, um, a peer-reviewed um, journal for, for that purpose. And, you know, it's a, it's a big push, uh, frankly, because, um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not your standard um, approach to research. There are a few produce, there's a few scientists around the globe that are actually getting there and, and our job is to recruit those kinds of, of papers that we know are going to move the needle on regenerative agriculture. In a way, John Lundgren is a classic example of the work that he is doing. Richard Teague is another um, scientist and uh, David Johnson. These guys are, on my mind, they're moving the needle on Regen Ag. And hopefully in, in the next three years, we will have um, some of our data of our own uh, to kind of push out there. But, you know, we're trying to support everybody. Um, we want everybody uh, doing everything that they can because we don't have a lot of time and we're much stronger working together than we are trying to, you know, everybody do their own thing. So hopefully we can collaborate and make this thing go faster. We need to make like bacteria and synergize. Mm -hmm. Like that. <clears throat> yeah, so um, thank you. And our next question comes from Dan Cox, who's a uh, coffee grower in Duluth. He's about coming up on his uh, year three of, of coffee growing. And so we'll be tasting coffee cherries for the first time from uh, Duluth, North County, San Diego in 2021. And Dan was asking about 50% uh, of fertilizer uh, applied is lost to the environment. And just, is this, is this true with fertigation? Um, so just kind of, I think uh, Cynthia made the claim that 50% of fertilizer is lost to the environment. Just want to know, is this true with fertigation systems? Yeah, I did try to put a citation in, in uh, the chat there. And, and clearly, how you apply, what you apply, and when you apply will have a dramatic impact on how much nitrogen is actually lost from your system. And, you know, uh, doing, you know, I think those numbers by and large really come from side dressing and, and conventional agriculture as it is today. <laughs> All right. It. So I'm thinking that you probably do a much better job if you're injecting deep into the soil. I, I love this deep root. Um, as long as, you know, it depends on what you're uh, fertigating with. 
Um, if it's, uh, you know, in, in, in ammonium nitrate, you know, it is going to leach. You are going to lose some of that. Um, so, you know, I, I like the idea of fertigating a little bit at a time over time. If you're a sandy profile, if you have very low clay, you're going to leach more. It's going to be problematic even more. So in sandy soils, you have more leaching. But if you can place that down into the root zone, if you can place it in a way that it's not open to the air for um, oxidation, you reduce the incidence of, of nitrogen loss. So I, I think you're thinking the right thoughts. I think fertigation helps. But if you're emitting that with an emitter out into the open air, you're probably going to be losing more than just 50%. Just keep that in mind. Okay. All right. So our next question comes from Chuck Samuelson, who hopefully will be putting some coffee into North County, San Diego in the coming year. He's just uh, saying he's new to this uh, regenerative agricultural conversation and would like any orgs or people to know about. Um, I'll, I'll start, Chuck. I think the Land Institute is a very inspiring um, organization to get familiar with. They're based out in Salina, Kansas. Um, Wes Jackson is a, a really fantastic uh, leader of that organization and a, um, a well-published author. Um, also, Terra Genesis is another uh, great org out there in the regenerative agricultural space. Um, what do you think, uh, Jesse? You want to throw maybe yeah. two out there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's uh, quite a host of people who are working in different realms. Uh, Mad Agriculture is doing some great work with uh, Heritage Grains out in the Midwest. Uh, the Quivera Coalition is doing some fantastic work with watershed restoration. Um, you know, Picinus Ranch and Tomcat Ranch are Northern California organizations that um, are, are looking at kind of broad acre uh, grassland grazing, bringing back perennial um, bunch grasses. Um, uh, there's a great, I mean, you go up to, I mean, if you're looking for some really good nursery stock, OAEC is doing some great education work up in the North Bay and has an amazing nursery. Um, and then there's another organization. I'll drop a I'm trying to remember the name of it. Cynthia, maybe you can help me out. Oh, the Savannah Institute. The Savannah Institute, and they're doing some really good work in uh, perennial cropping systems and agroforestry uh, systems as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I could, uh, on my slides as well, um, on our web, actually, I think a couple of our web sites, we have a few maps. Of different organizations around the country that you can you can find as well um, and pull some names from there. Nice. Yeah, the um, Savannah Institute is actually having their perennial farm gathering on the sixth through the ninth of uh, December, and that'll be online. So they focus on uh, perennials. Um, great, Cynthia. Did you have some? Did you want, wanted to add? Looks like you had your youngster waking up and. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> yep, yep. She's uh, she's a good one though. She really does. She loves regenerative agriculture. I can talk about it all day. And she kind of eases her into a nice sleep. So I hope I did. I hope I haven't uh, done the same to all of you. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, my first grandbaby, um, and uh, my son has been. Uh, yeah, I think they're trying to figure out how to how to manage, you know, life now with, uh, with a baby. And, you know, they're both are very active people as well. And since I'm working from home these days, it makes it a little bit easier for me to help them out. But yeah, there you yeah. are. Um, with, I had a question on biochar too. I did want to touch on on that. And, you know, maybe Jesse, you can jump in here at any point in time, but biochar varies so much. Very, the quality of the biochar really matters. And it really depends on, uh, the temperature at which you know it's it's fired. Uh, the temperature and the quality of the raw stocks going in are really an important component of biochar and it needs to be acclimated. You know, so that biochar represents a lot of cavities. It's it's got a lot of cat got a lot of cavities, it's very, very porous material. If you can inoculate that in your compost or in your bioreactors, 
um, it makes it so much better. And you will sequester significantly more amount of, of carbon uh, because you're creating a, a, a basic community um, by providing um, shelter for all those organisms in that biochar. So it's really a magnificent thing, but it does need to be inoculated. It needs to be, uh, you need to take some time to, to do that before you do any direct applications. Just a little heads up so, on that. Um, just, I just wondered, are there machines you can buy or do you buy it by the bag or how, how do you get biochar? Yeah, I. Uh, you can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I'll say I did. I did drop a link in there. There is a producer down in Oxnard that does commercial uh, production. Um, you can go down the YouTube rabbit hole of making your own um, burn chambers. Um, they're they're they're. It's a pretty low cost way of producing a good amount of biochar if you have a couple 55 gallon drums and a place to do a safe burn. But as Cin Cindy just mentioned, quality is key. Um, so there are professional outfits out there that, that do buy it, um, or sorry, do, do sell it. Okay, because I heard it had to be uh, burned at a super high temperature to be effective. To be yeah, good we, we, we just did a burn the other day um, on a, it was called a T-LUD, a top lit updraft so essentially a 55 gallon black metal drum with perforated holes in the bottom um, and you pack it full of material and light the top and then put another 55 gallon drum on top that has an air vent to create that thermal suck um, and it, it finished in 20 minutes it you couldn't come within 10 feet of it it was so hot oh. um, and uh, and we got about I would say a decomposed to about maybe a, a quarter of that 55 gallon drum um, and we're, we're inoculating right now to go in our planting next week with the coffee. Oh, cool. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So kind of moving along with our conversation, we got uh, Luke McCormick uh, asking, is there an outline on the professional series course that was uh, piloted? There, there is, and I'll need to share it. It's too much information to put in the chat. So I think what I'll do, Ben, is I'll just share that with you on an email afterwards and you can. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Jesse spoke a little bit to the uh, journal. The journal is something that looks like uh, uh, CSU is, is putting forward. Doesn't it sounds like there hasn't been an issue published yet, but you're still uh get gathering uh research papers for it correct uh, that's yeah. right it's a work Great. in progress so yeah we nice. hope it to, to make it very user friendly and uh, something that the farmers can put to use um immediately you know rather than yeah you know, sit on a shelf somewhere and we want to make it very user friendly yeah all right so uh next uh, question again from dan uh, will a cover crop, um, uh, some of the nutrients supplied, adding biochar, how do you procure biochar? We talked a little bit about that. Uh, and then grants that are available for uh, regenerative agriculture. So why don't we start off with the cover crop uh, question. So I, how I do cover crop? My own question, and I, I forgot to say, will, will it steal some of the nitrogen or is it... Uh, Oh, gotcha. Yeah, that, that's a common concern that, that producers have is that, you know, if, if you feel like you've got a limited system by adding in a cover crop, you're going to, you know, um, steal nutrients from your crop. And you need to kind of, you need to move away from that mentality and realize that that cover crop is going to provide more back to your system. It may take a little water to get it going and it may take some nutrients, but what it provides back into your ecological system is significantly more, magnitudes more than what you can really realize uh, because it adds diversity. It builds soil biology. Um, you know, all those diverse roots are producing different types of, of proteins and sugars and carbohydrates that are supporting different communities of microorganisms. So that diversity is really key. And you're also rebuilding that really, uh, that, the, and that biology is gonna help feed your crop. So by feeding the livestock in the soil, you're gonna be feeding your crop 
um, in the end. So you don't want to think about it as a as a mathematical equation anymore. You're trying to create more biological diversity, and that will help you um, boatloads by the bucket. Did I answer that question? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to. I'll add as well, um, there's some great research that was done by um, Allison Fishrow over at the UC A&R this last year, focused on cover crop profiles, both single species and multi-species cover crop. And I can probably dig up some of the findings from their research because one thing that came out was the resounding positive was those cover crop um, um, applications that incorporated a diversity of plant species as well as functional groups outperform drastically both germination rates as well as forage production as well as ground coverage. Um, so, you know, one thing that I've found in, in kind of early years of cover cropping when I, you know, was approaching it in an orchard setting saying, well, we want to add nitrogen, so let's put out some nitrogen fixers and put out a bunch of clover and didn't get, you know, uh, a, a good result. Um, was that there's actually, and this kind of comes back to the quorum sensing and quorum signaling conversation that Cynthia was having, is that the, the different root profiles, the different beneficial microbes and fungi and the different associations that they have actually create this quorum effect where the diversity creates the conditions for all of them to thrive better. Um, and it's not a sense of like competition, it's this mutualism where they create one shades out the other, the other one, you know, makes some plant nutrient available to the other. And so we get so much more out of it. So um, we did a, a really nice low growing profile in some of our orchards, some of our areas that were access roads and such, we did a higher kind of biomass production um, mix that we were using with a, just a hand scythe to be able to kind of flail it into our orchards as a mulch. Um, I think, you know, actually I have, yeah, this was actually, this was a pre-mix. It was organic OMRI listed. Um, and I'll just drop it in the chat. I had it in one of our PDFs. Uh, but you can kind of see what the percentage was of you know, clovers and trefoil and fescues and native poppies and baby's breath and sweet alyssum and yarrow Perfect. and stuff That's like that. Yeah. And that, that was, I can't I remember where, where, where the source was, but it was a fantastic mix. And we got a, we got a great germination rate and, and fantastic pollinators. Uh, uh, stand and flowers that came up in the spring and um, we let it all go to seed before taking them down. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I'm just making a little copy of this, um, our chat so we don't lose it when uh, get off. Um, all right. So let's see. I don't know if I saw too many other questions in there. Let's see here. Um, Grants available for regenerative agriculture. Cynthia put some links in the in the chat. Um, yeah. Thank That's you for correct. that, Cynthia. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's I can. Go I, ahead. No, I was just I was going to reinforce. Unfortunately, it's not. I don't believe it's going to be offered next year. The Healthy Soils Grant. We we're a recipient of uh, two different Healthy Soils grants that paid for. Uh, some cover crop seed, it paid for some tree stock for hedgerows, paid for straw for mulching, um, you know, and, and that was through the CDFA. <laughs> I think it got deprioritized this next year, but we have uh, hope that um, it'll be it'll be returned to the books here in the next few years um, once some of the outcomes of these grant uh, or grant processes um, show positive effects. There's also um, uh, an organization that Benjamin uh, mentioned at the beginning, Kiss the Ground, that I consult with. Uh, they're based out of LA. Um, it's not so much a grant, but they have a scholarship opportunity for producers looking for um, uh, education uh, and training opportunities. So both um, a Holistic Managed Grazing, uh, Soil Health Academy, and their Agrarians platform are all uh, provided uh, through that. And um, the, I think the greater value add there is that they also come out and do baseline soil uh, metrics and monitoring um, for you uh, in year one. Um, and then uh, it gets you in the running if you actually do start to apply some of these principles of regenerative agriculture to have that same uh, profile taken in year three. Um, and, it's a, and it's a fairly comprehensive panel of infiltration rates. Uh, so organic carbon, organic nitrogen, um, so organic matter, um, bulk density. They do even a PFLA, a polyphytolipid acid test for biological diversity. Um, 
So there, there's a lot that goes into it as well as uh, uh, resourcing calls with a, a farmland program advisor quarterly to kind of check in, provide more resources. There's equipment shares for no-till seeders. Um, there, there, there's a lot of value in that um, in that grant. And so you can go to kissetheground.com and find the farmland program in there. Great, and we had a question from Dave Wallace. Uh, any suggestions and tips for livestock grazing or parameters around that? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, there's, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't know just how, how much grazing could take place around coffee plants. Um, are, are livestock inclined to eat that? Do we know what the what uh, livestock eat? Actually, you know, coffee's pretty, um, the caffeine content in coffee is pretty much a natural deterrent for um, most kind of animals. There are some animals that do like the coffee cherries in, in Southeast Asia, um, but we haven't uh, encountered too much uh, pest pressure on the plant outside of um, gophers kind of in its infancy. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, nor yeah. have we integrated too much uh, animal life with with coffee orchards. Right. Okay. Well, I just wanted to direct people to we have an educational website. We call it Regenerative Ag 101, and it's a, a user friendly website where you can go to get um, you know information on these different regenerative ag production practices. So you know, like cover cropping and biomass, we've accumulated quite a bit of uh, information here about about that particular regenerative ag practice, along with crop rotation, soil inoculants, composting, tillage, adaptive grazing. You know, we've just updated that page, livestock and crop integration. And um, it's a combination of videos, instructional videos, and um, papers. There is some science. We've, we've downloaded some of the best science in those areas, if, if that's what you're after. But I think as far as the adaptive grazing, you could go there. We've got a new um, one on silvopasture. But I really love the idea of the Savannah Institute. You know, if you guys can sit in on that, you know, that's a perennial cropping system institute that I think you could gain a lot of value from. I would strongly encourage you that, you know, to interact, you know, with, with, with them. Um, I think they're kind of out of the Midwest. Um, I think they're doing quite a bit with Al Gore's farm. I know that the... Uh, Gabrielle was just telling me that they did a lot of uh, chestnut harvesting and, and livestock grazing in those systems. We just don't do a lot out here because it's just not, not a, a technique that people are um, doing much of. So I apologize for that. Let me see if I can't get that done. Anyway, um, I think you should be able to go onto this website and see about adaptive grazing, regenerative grazing out in livestock situation. Silver pasturing is probably going to be the, the practice, production practice that, that better fits um, coffee growers uh, because you're trying to graze animals in and among um, your other cropping systems. Uh, well, well I, Jesse, yeah, I was going to add. I was going to add, you know, I think that one of the major limiting factors for us in grazing um, undulates in our system is the fact that we are integrating coffee into avocados. And coffee, I mean, avocados has a very difficult context to handle because livestock do like avocados and it is poisonous to them. It has person, which they actually don't really regulate well and, and it builds up. And so, um, it wouldn't be the coffee that would be the limiting factor. I think it would be more the, the avocado. But I think that more than looking at uh, civil pastor, I think that there's some examples that we can draw from in the vineyard context. There's some um, innovative work being done at uh, both Pablo's Creek Vineyard as well as up at Picinus Ranch for both designing, um, that would be designing the vineyard specifically for grazing animals um, as well as designing herds and adaptive management um, uh, plans to meet the needs of specific crops. Um, so for, for grapes, it's when they're suckering um, and, and how high the trellises are and the, the sheep come in and they do the spring suckering, but the, 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 the trellises are high enough that they can essentially block off full kind of acres or quarter acres and they don't have to keep them within the rows, if you will. Um, another thing is the appropriate animal and the, you know, there's a, a European um, sheep called the baby doll that's 
Um, it's much more diminutive. Uh, it's more of a, a browser than a grazer. Um, I'm sorry, it's more of a grazer than a browser. Um, and so it doesn't want to look at the, the trees as much. And I know Ben J. Rusky, um, one of the masterminds behind Fringe, recently showed me video and photos of um, deer grazing in one of the uh, coffee uh, plantations that wouldn't, wouldn't even pay attention, that weren't paying attention to the coffee. And they were in full, full foliage. And that, would, that just blew my mind because, um, you know, the sheep, I'm sorry, the, uh, the deer even nibble on our, um, on our avocado. So just to see them not paying any uh, mind to, to the coffee was, was nice. I'm not sure if that was a singular event or if that's been consistent from your experience. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, I don't think it's a singular event. I think it's consistent with our experience. Um, yeah, like, you know, we've only had problems with gophers and mostly in year one. Um, I'd like to know what's the difference between a browser and a grazer? Yeah, I mean, I think the rule of thumb is that uh, cattle are uh, grazers, head down, grass. Uh, goats are browsers, head up, shrubs and trees. Sheep are uh, in the middle. They, they, they can take a little bit of both. So if you were to design a multi-species herd for a landscape, you can kind of back of the envelope rule of thumb say that cattle are going to get 75% of their dry matter intake from, uh, from, from grazing and 25 from browsing. Uh, goat are the opposite, 75 browsing, 25 grazing, and then sheep are 50-50. Um, and, and there's some really um, great operations like uh, Will Harris down at White Oaks Pasture that essentially is using, you know, 10 different livestock species to manage their different uh, kind of eco tones throughout their property. Um, pigs for, you know, the wetlands and clearing underbrush, uh, cattle for rangeland, uh, goat and sheep for some of their scrub brush and stuff like that. Um, and then the whole suite of first birds for following up behind some of the larger undulates um, to be able to kind of brace, break pest cycles and roost in trees and provide another um, nitrogen uh, kind of uh, input. So anyways, uh, yeah. go, go, around, go around the world and, you know, people would laugh at you running only one kind of animal on a piece of land. You know, they, they, are, yeah. they all, just, just like cover crops, animals have mutual <laughs> relationships. Yeah, and the goat is the classical kind of spirit animal of coffee. If, you know, spending time in Ethiopia, you just see all the, the goat herds running everywhere around the place. And the dancing goats is kind of given credit for making the discovery of, of the coffee plants, you know, the consuming of the cherries. They were all getting all high off the caffeine. Um, so to go back, and then, you know, one of the animals that we do encourage is the owl. We like the owl boxes on, on the properties. It's a little bit of a different kind of, um, collaboration there, not necessarily um, using the owls for anything, but their uh, help with the pests. Um, so to get back into the questions, uh, let's see here, we have, um, we have Robin, we're hoping to use a diverse cover crop under our avocados and citrus orchards, hoping to graze chickens on the new uh, cover crop. Where can we find out what cover crop mix would be, would be beneficial? We, have, we live in Cayugos, California. Um, Jesse, you put a mix there in the chat. Yeah, that was, that was our um, low growing cover crop mix uh, this last year. Um, one thing to be aware of is chickens are pretty, chickens are scratchers and peckers. Um, and they're, they're pretty, they have a pretty heavy impact on, uh, on the soil. They, they like to dig up grubs and worms. Um, and so for avocados that have a, uh, uh, historically a, a shallow uh, root structure, um, they like peat mulch. They like to dance in that kind of top uh, six to 18 inches of, uh, of soil, but they definitely have feeder roots up there right at the soil surface because they want to be right underneath that mulch layer. Um, too much, too much impact from, uh, from chickens um, can actually have a negative Im impact. We actually found um, a little bit of a lighter touch from, from ducks, from Muscovy ducks. Um, and, mus and ducks also are more prone to actually eating grasses and cover crops. The chickens don't really eat grass and cover crops. They want to eat the grubs and the worms and the bugs that are underneath it. Um, so just something to consider as well if you're looking at using forest birds um, in an orchard setting. 
and the the ducks go after the snails as well too which is great yes yes most definitely and i think the second part of that question was actually sourcing for cover crop um, SNS Seeds provides some good cover crop mixes. Um, LA Hearn um, also provides some good cover crop mixes. I can drop a couple of links in here that we've used in the past. Um, yeah. I think those are your local sources are going to be the best, that's for sure. We've got several sources, but they're up here in Northern California. All right, the last question I'm seeing up here. Uh, is regarding um, are moles handled the same as gophers? Uh, the owls don't seem to find the moles. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we, our biggest considerations are ground squirrels and gophers. Um, and we essentially create as much habitat for snakes as we can. We put up hot perches or after perches and we put up hat boxes. Our bat boxes were, were literally occupied in less than a week. We have three of them, one on either side of the property and then one right in the middle, and less than a week there, we, we spent dusk. There was barn owls flying in and out of them. I just pulled, literally last night I pulled up and there was two barn owls sitting right on our fence, right underneath one of the owl boxes, um, and there's owl pellets everywhere. That's not to say we still don't have an immense amount of pressure from covers and ground squirrels. I'm just saying that, that you know, part of our integrated approach to pest management is to create habitat for the, uh, the, the predators within the system. Um, one thing that I think we have really started to lose um, in our landscapes is the um, wildlife corridors that would have protected um, packs such as coyotes that are huge, huge um, uh, ground vermin predators. Um, and, and the coyotes have been displaced significantly from kind of our urban wildland corridors and our agricultural uh, landscapes. Um, and, and I think between, between that and a few other contributing factors, we've kind of seen a breakdown in the self-regulating part of our system that would have kept some of these vermins in check. All right, thank you. Well, does anyone else have any other questions they want to throw out there? I want to thank Cynthia and thank Jesse for their for their time today. They did a really great presentations and we'll put this up on uh, YouTube along with some of the comments in the uh, in the chat. Great. great. Thank you very much for the day. I, I enjoy it very much. And uh, don't yeah. reach out if there's anything else that you know we can follow up on. Um, green seed cover or green cover seed, they've got like a cover crop seed calculator that might be able to help you come up with a mix based on things. A lot of people are using cover crops, you know, as a, as a remedy, you know, for some of the deficiencies and issues that you might have uh, programmatically in your program, um, you know, like mustards for nematodes, that type of thing. So yeah, I think people would, would yeah, you might benefit from that. I'll drop that website into the chat and there may be others out there that I'm just not aware of. Yeah, I agree. There's there's a great uh, uh, framework I think proposed by Kate Brown at that Soil Health Academy that he brought up at Chico State that was uh, essentially the question all the different resource concerns that you might have. Here we go. Let me drop this in. There's a list of the different resource concerns you might be looking to address with your cover crops. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing to keep in mind. What are you actually trying to accomplish by applying cover crops? Um, and uh, I really do appreciate the questions and everyone being present. There was one person who had inquired about potentially doing a site visit. Um, I have been planning uh, a potential field day with Ben to um, get people out to see our new planting here probably um, in spring. Um, we may we might be able to do it a little bit sooner, but we'll, we'll have to check and see. So. Um, I'm sure Ben has uh, a mail list for people that are present here today, um, but we'd be more than welcome to, or more than happy to welcome you out to the land and show you a little bit of uh, what we have going on. All right, great. So um, just uh, real quickly, our next um, coffee dialogue uh, will take place on December 17th. That's a Thursday from 1 to 3 p.m. And the title of that 
we'll be understanding wild morphology, phenotypes, and adaptation. So it's kind of a fancy way of talking about pruning. Um, and we'll have Dr. Andrea Kawabata from the University of Hawaii, who does a lot of research with coffee producers in, on the islands. And then uh, a world-renowned coffee grower by the name of Ricardo Coiner, uh, who produces coffee in the Boquete area of Panama. So two people a lot of, with a lot of experience on what the shape of coffee plants uh, should take and some of the benefits and techniques for pruning. Um, and so with that, I, I think I'll just say thank you to everybody and um, we'll close this session up. Thanks so much. Thank you.